and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I direct the creative writing program here at Brookdale and I'm part of the English faculty. Today on our show, I am very excited to have the absolutely wonderful poet Jamal May, whose book Hum was a winner of the Beatrice Holly Award from Alice James Book and was also a finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, among many, many, many other honors it received. <laughs> um, so welcome to the show, Jamal. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about how you came to writing. And, and sort of the influences that shaped you along the way to producing this wonderful book. Oh, well, um, my twin sister figured out that I was a writer way before I did. Um, she kind of- Is she an identical twin? Is this one of the, she knows your thoughts kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be identical if it's uh, for a boy girl, like of by default, <laughs> by default. <laughs> um, but um, it, I don't know, there is a, definitely a synchronicity. And she was yeah. the kind of the literature type person in the house. and. Read. I mean, she's a speed reader. She reads like a few novels a week, mm -hmm. and um, and I was working on music stuff. And when I was writing, she was like, saying, "Yo, you should look into getting into poetry." She was into Poetry Slam and um, like mm -hmm. Jessica Care Moore, Saul Williams, and these kinds of things. And um, at first, I was just like, "No, nah, that's not what I do." And and also the idea of like getting up in front of people was not <laughs> really on the table. Uh -huh. um, I was like terrified of other humans, but I was, but I was in my just in my little kind of little dungeon by myself, just making uh -huh. making yeah. stuff. And um, so she kind of like really put believed in that I had whatever that was she saw, and mm -hmm. that was in the back of my mind when I wanted to challenge myself to step outside of my box and maybe try to um, do something with it. And I first started with Slam, and mm -hmm. the first time I did it, I saw a version of myself that I had never encountered. And it was just kind of like, yo, I've been hanging out with this dude for like 20 years and we've never had a conversation. And I was fascinated and kind of drawn uh -huh. to that. And um, and the rush too of like kind of taking all that anxiety and fear and kind of trying to channel it into like giving the words space. Uh -huh. And so I started writing like a bunch of poems. Like the, the first thing I ever presented was kind of, was a song, that like a hip hop song that mm -hmm. I just kind of reordered in my head because I wrote everything okay. in my head back then. Had you been performing as a musician? I hadn't, like oh, not so at this all. this really was the it, first time. Yeah, and then, yeah. Um, and so I really was like, oh, okay, I need to go into this deeper. And so, and from there, it kind of just kept, I kept pushing what I was afraid of and, and expanding it. And so that was that's what brought me to the page a couple of years later, because I, I used to write in my head, but I kind of wanted to get things on concrete so they could last. Mm -hmm. And started working with Vivi Francis, who was an amazing poet and a really great teacher. And uh -huh. we were just doing community, like she was just like working with a small group of writers. And um, I can't thank her enough for that, because she really she's the one that really gave me like the path, like mm -hmm. everything from this is how you format a cover letter to send to a journal to this is what metonymy is. Uh, this uh -huh. is this is like a different way to use a metaphor, and um, that that kind of like set me on that path. And it's just been just kind of put just taking one step at a time, trying not to skip steps, like always kind of being like, what don't I know? And mm -hmm. um, and eventually, like somehow there was a book. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like I just wrote lots of poems, and then I was like okay, it's time maybe I should put these into a collection, and it, it all kind of just kept evolving from it's like a fractal like like an image like you start with a piece of a snowflake and then that snowflake just gets bigger and bigger <laughs> and until you have 74 pages exactly. <laughs> yeah. um well it's, it's it's an incredible first book and it's gotten Thank a you. huge amount of of, of acclaim and been nominated yeah, and still awards. freaking me out yeah i was just saying what's <laughs> what's this experience been like having your first book come out in the world very with a huge bang Really? Uh, it was weird because um, right up, I mean, all the way up until it, it, it showed up, I was kind of back and forth from like, I think a good number of people are gonna dig it. Like, I don't know who's gonna dig it, and I, I couldn't really tell what the audience would be mm -hmm. because I would have, um, like, I would have some people describing it as like the work is complex. When I was doing these readings and things, they yeah. would describe it as dense, you know, and, com and complex. And then I go to other places and they say, "Yo, what I really like about the work is it's straightforward, you know, and clear." <laughs> and so I was like, "Which is it?" You know, <laughs> and um, because I came up through Slam, I knew I had this like kind of whole other community that yeah. I like hoped <laughs> would like support the book. And at mm -hmm. the same time, I got really lucky because at the same time, the Slam community had been evolving and um, getting much more. Um, 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 uh, Literate's not the right word, but just reading more and more books. Because yeah. Slam Community always read lots of books, sure. but, but it became- There were more crossover artists. There was way Patricia more crossover. Smith, Patricia Smith yeah. carved out a, pa a path yeah. for me, basically. And there were, I watched that transition from where people yeah. stopped saying, you know, when, where's your CD to where's your book? And hmm. so I kind of had a feeling that there, the community there would like be supportive. And then um, I was, um, well, I just kind of wasn't sure like what that audience would be. 
And what I tried to do with the book was kind of try to create something that had a little space for everyone. I tried yeah. to create space for the reader with it. And so when it came out, when it, I started, when it really it immediately, like, I mean, the pre-orders, like even just the pre-orders, mm -hmm. it was like kind of like in Amazon, I was like selling well on Amazon before it was even out on the, the pre-orders. And then I put up a thing through my, the chapbook press I run where you can yeah. order a signed pre-order copy on the website. And I saw like hundreds of them, <laughs> like, that. and I was like, okay, the book's gonna be okay. Like, you know, and I, so I was like, okay, the book's gonna be okay. And I was like, okay with that. But I couldn't have imagined like just how much support it got. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting emails from like I'd get an email from like this avant-gardist writer that's like, yeah, this is what we're talking about. This is like, this is where poetry needs to be going. And then I get an email from somebody that's like, yo, my grandmother's never read a book of poems before, but like she yeah. had yours in the car and she like, she kept it. She wouldn't give it back to me. Or like <laughs> emails from 15 year olds that are memorizing poems and reciting them mm -hmm. for their classmates. And, so, and then at first I was like, I was really confused by that. And then there was like this moment where I was like, oh, it worked. Like, like this idea that you could write poetry for like, for everybody, you know, that I didn't have to write it for a specific specific aesthetic camp and but I just didn't think that would actually work I thought I would aim for that and mm -hmm. then you know you know fail somewhere closer to the finish mm -hmm. line if I did that so um it really was kind of shocking and in some ways overwhelming to yeah. have everybody just be like, yeah, it works. It, it does work. It, it absolutely does. But there's also a wide range of concerns in the book as well, too, yeah. um, that I think gives there are many doorways into the collection and, you know, whichever you know, I think different people are entering in different ways. And I think that's part probably of the response that you're, that you're hearing. The book's dedicated to Detroit though, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, and I wonder if you could kind yeah. of talk about that. Yeah, you'll note it. that it's specifically dedicated to the interior lives of Detroiters. Um, when I was working on, like just writing all these poems, I was yeah. actually actively trying not to write about Detroit. And which is where you live, yeah, where which you're is, from. I'm born and raised in Detroit. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's a good thing to know because I noticed, talk to a lot of young writers, that a lot of people think that I kind of set out with a clear project in mind. Uh -huh. And so I kind of want to be clear that like, I think there's a lot, of, a lot to be gained from just writing and seeing what you come up with and mm -hmm. just generating a lot of stuff. And so I, I've seen a lot of lazy art coming out about Detroit. Um, mm -hmm. the, the media's perception of it was just so narrow and mm -hmm. limited. And then people's response to that media's per perception was still narrow and limited. People, because people would kind of just go to the, like, like, no, oh, Detroit's awesome, and here's all the landmarks I know in Motown, you know, or, <laughs> and or Motown, <laughs> right? Or you know, the same photograph of the abandoned train station. It was just really mm -hmm. lazy art about the city. And so I just kind of my whole thing is like I'm trying to go where the trouble is. So I just I want to write the interior. I want mm -hmm. to write more about interactions with people and people's interactions with themselves and that was kind of became my focus but then when I had all these poems written in all these from all these different angles and perspectives and concerns when I put them all together it was like I was reading all this it was just like a bunch of Detroiters just like collected but not the kind of Detroiters you see on the news yeah. like I kind of accidentally did what I wish other artists <laughs> were doing with mm -hmm. the Detroit thing and so I want not dedicated not specifically to Detroit because what I've found is that my sense of place is so people related. When mm -hmm. people ask me how, what I think of a city, I can't really say anything about it except what the people were there, you know, yeah. like what the people were like. Um, that's why it's been my thing, uh, more so than the food or even the architecture. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm big on architecture, but I'm like, who did I meet there? Who did yeah. I have a conversation with? Well, that's one of the things I wondered about as well, because for, for a book that definitely has a lot of kind of markers of that yeah. place, that it is actually so sort of personal and, and looking at, at kind of individual people throughout it and, and how you approach this idea of space and place. Yeah. They seem kind of conflated in a way. Yeah, and like you'll notice in the look, these were conscious choices. There are no land, there are no land, like specific landmarks yeah. except maybe I think the Detroit River appears, but there is no like, I don't name, name check. I feel like a lot of times people write poems place, they name check a lot of things in the area mm -hmm. and that can get you like a lot of rousing applause from people from those places. Mm -hmm. And I um, mean, there are a couple of small things that I've mentioned, specifically because I think from a poetic standpoint, it gave a really personal moment, like when mm -hmm. I name check Honey Bee Market. You don't have to have been to Honey Bee Market for that to be delightful. Like yeah, you know, no. <laughs> to say, like I'm gonna buy a, I'm gonna buy a bowl of, I'm gonna eat a bowl of handmade guacamole from Honey Bee Market. It's like you, you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about, no matter where you're yeah. from. Um, and because I really was trying to write something broad for, like write poems that are broad and for mm -hmm. like everybody. And so the sense of the city starts to become like the textures, it starts to be mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 stone and the, the rust and the and also, but also the leaves and mm -hmm. um, the grass and um, like and the, and the birds like there are birds all through the book that it was funny to me that a lot of people didn't notice the birds the uh -huh. first go around and I actually ended up with a poem out of that like that's in the second book called there are birds here <laughs> um, but, but so and I, and so I think that's why it feels like more 
like people base is because I think that actually aids it by not having a lot of street names and specific right. landmarks to be the girders the girders to it. I want the girders to be <clears throat> what what people there were going through and and thinking yeah. about and also a broad range of people and like broad yeah. range um, cuz that's the thing that gets left out of the conversation about Detroit. Um, they talk about Detroit as if it's like Mad Max wasteland like or something <laughs> like when and we're always just like no, we just we're living here. We're like yeah. Going to our banging jazz club, the oldest jazz club in the world. Like we're hanging out in there, you know. Mm -hmm. Like the DIA is the largest collection of African American art, like in the country. We're hanging mm -hmm. out in there, you know. Yeah. I want to do that, but without the like the specifics of yeah. the place being the focal point, the actual interior experience being the focal point. We're, we're going to take a break in just one minute. So, a really quick question, which is, do you think you would be the same poet if you hadn't born and raised in Detroit? Oh, not even close. Um, if the work ethic alone, like one thing I realized, like we'll talk, I was talking to my partner Sarfia about like some of the like like um, like different kinds of students, you know, yeah. that you run across, you know. And one of the things that we kept, I realized we kept leaving out of the discussion. We're talking about these, all these complicated ways that, like, and it was like, oh, some of them just don't have a work ethic, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like a, like a good work ethic. And I think that alone was like huge in just my Detroiters process. have a strong work ethic. Yeah, and right. it, it was it's just it was implicit, you know. All right. Well, on that note, we, we will take a break and we'll come back. I'm talking with Jamal May. I will see you after the break. Welcome to this segment of Brookdale Newsmakers. Hi, my name is Amy Ferris. Welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. Hi, I'm Tim Catalfamo, and I'm standing here at the 2014 Brookdale Spring Open House. Diagnostic Medical Sonography is an entry-level, full-time, 12-month training program. The program is designed to prepare qualified individuals to operate diagnostic medical sonography equipment safely and competently to produce diagnostic ultrasound images. Upon successful completion of the program, individuals are eligible to sit for the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists in Sonography Certification Exam. Apply early. Enrollment is limited. For more information, call 732-224-2315. My daughter was born premature, and the hospital's respiratory therapist saved her life. When the economy crashed, we moved back to New Jersey for my husband's career, but nobody was hiring drama teachers. So I joined the respiratory therapy program at Brookdale. It's a great field with job security, and you can be there for people who really need you. My name is Joriel Miller, and I came to Brookdale to change my career. I never imagined I could help save a life. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm here talking with the wonderful poet, Jamal May. Um, so before the break, we were talking about um, Detroit and how it's sort of in your work. And I was wondering if maybe you could uh, share a poem with us from the book, from Hum. OK, um, this poem um, is called Athazagoraphobia, which is the fear of being ignored. <clears throat> I used to bury plum pits between houses, bury bits of wire there too. Used to bury matches, but nothing ever burned and nothing ever thrived. So I set fire to a mattress, disassembled a stereo, attacked flies with a water pistol and drowned ants in perfume. I pierced my eyebrow, inserted a stainless steel bar, traded that for a scar in a melee 
Press tongue to nipple in a well-lit parking lot, swerved into traffic while unbuttoning my shirt. There is a woman waiting for me to marry her or forget her name forever, whichever loosens the ribbons from her hair. Hmm. I fill the bathtub for an enemy. I lick the earlobe of my nemesis. I try to dance like firelight without setting anyone ablaze. I am leaning over the railing of a bridge, seeing my face shimmer on the river below. It's everywhere now. Look for me in the scattered windshield beneath an overpass, in a sculpture of a man with metal skin grafts, in patterns of mud draggled wood, leaves circling feathers in rainwater. Look. Even the blade of a knife holds my quickly fading likeness while I run out of ways to say, I am here. Hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for sharing it. That's wonderful. I wonder, Mark Doty has talked about the idea that for him, a poem starts with an image. Um, and I wonder where a poem starts for you. Oh, I heard Doty say that in the talk before, and I thought that was um, I'm really fascinating because I've, I've had poems spring from there too. Mm -hmm. And but when he, as soon as he, I heard him say that, the thing I realized was that I had like all these like little Jack in the Box things that would, poems would spring out of. Uh -huh. um, and I think a big part of my process is kind of letting thing like letting everything play a part. Um, lately, I've been thinking of writing as this really cumulative process, not just mm -hmm. when I sit down to type or scribble. Like mm -hmm. I think of that as the drafting. But, uh, um, and that's the, like, bringing everything together. And I'm going through my life just collecting all of those pieces. Um, uh -huh. um, and, and so a poem for me starts in a variety of places. It can start with just, like, an image, and I'm just like, oh, that's, that's something. Um, a lot of times we'll start with a comparison. Like, I'll see, um, I'm always, um, you can see in the book that there's always this duality. There's always, like, a little of this and a little of that. Mm -hmm. Which, going back to earlier, I think that's a part of why so many people responded, was because I was trying to create a space in between polarities and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are frustrated with like the forced polarity in our country mm -hmm. most people are, understand that life is a gradient but like our media and our interactions a lot of times kind of feels like it demands this separation sure. um, so I look for things that contradict uh, while they match up and, mm -hmm. and so when something like that strikes I me mean, last time I was a poem will be born out of that um, rarely do a poem does a poem come out of a specific concern that I want to address um, but there are poems that do that um, like there's a poem in the book called the sky now black with birds Mm -hmm. um, that um, well, it was like kind of the uh, executions were weighing on me, but yeah. but I'm um, when I, whenever some, there's something that feels really charged that's begging to be a poem, those are the ones that I wait the longest on, uh -huh. be because um, David Baker t told me you know a poem can't be one thing it has to be at least two. Um, hmm. Because you have to have something pressing against something else yeah. to get traction, to get movement. Yeah. And yeah. so um, when when an issue is really grabbing at you or the loss of a person that's really aching, it can feel like enough to just address like one part of that. Yeah. And so I'll kind of put those aside, but they'll be there. And then when I got have the image or the mm -hmm. rhetorical the rhetorical move, that, that has actually gotten me to a, into a lot of poems. It's just hmm. the way I phrase something. Um, mm -hmm. So for that particular poem, once I had the phrasing, um, if I tell you, and this kind of conditional thing, because yeah. I knew I could write something that had a sociopolitical bent without getting preachy and didactic mm -hmm. if I started with if. You need the device. Right. Yeah. I can't be definitive while saying if. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This didactic, yeah, form. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so by saying if, if I tell right. you, um, if, 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 and that was my way inside that poem. And there's a lot yeah. of, there are a lot of poems in Hum. There's one called um, Man Matching Description. Again, mm -hmm. kind of a sociopolitical concern. Yeah. And so um, the because, the re like repetition of the word because became like my way to drive the poem forward. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. There's a number of phobia poems in the in the book, and they're wonderful. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering when you were when you were writing towards this book, or when you were looking at. I, I have a book here. Yeah. Um, actually, I guess which one was it? Were you writing towards the book itself, knowing you had that intention, or were you writing poems in sort of a, a kind of a, a more open sort of way? And how that the the phobia poems came to be sort of, yeah. the 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 line throughout the book. Well, yeah, I very much had just an open poem approach. It was yeah. just like, I was just like writing some everything. It's like, like, wait, how does the Sestina work? All right, let's do that. Like, okay, <laughs> what are you doing over there? That's like um, narrative. All right, okay, lyric poem. Yeah. I was trying to just do it, do a, lot, a lot of different things. And um, and that was a really good approach for me. I feel like yeah. if I would have came and said, I'm going to write a book like this and try to mm. pour everything into that mold, I would have never yeah. got anywhere. Because um, that, old, that old saying, no surprise for the writer, 
no surprise for the reader, yeah. you know, and I'm trying to surprise myself, and um, I don't know, like, you know, I'm like, um, well, I think it was Ian Forster said, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to say all the things and then kind of see what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I did, and then, and then um, I realized that the, I was trying to talk about discord, discord and things that go yeah. together. So I, but, so I wanted the poems to go all over the place, but I wanted these through lines. And the phobias became like a core um, through line um, in the process of working on it as a thesis. Did you already have them? Or did you notice uh, this could work? I'm gonna write some more of these. It started with like I had I wrote a I wrote a couple because yeah. I realized the phobia thing could be could function it could be function almost like a form. It was mm -hmm. it works almost like a um, an extended metaphor or conceit. Mm -hmm. Where when I say fear of waiting, everything I say in the poem, your brain is always checking back against what I said about the fear like of while waiting. Mm -hmm. And so I can say like you know a child with a foot pressed against the locked door of a closet, and your brain is connecting waiting, and it becomes yeah. that participatory thing. And so I got into the phobia poems when I realized I could do that with them. And um and I wrote a few I wrote more than are in the book and uh, most of them got cut. But um, Rick Barrett um, saw that the six f fears could be anchors across yeah. the book, and then um, and he challenged me to write a sestina where the six repeating words were from those six fears, and to show me, he just said it just to show me kind of what the tropes were that were popping up in, yeah. across the book. Um, but I took it as a challenge to like make the, the sestina work. Yeah. And, um, and, then, um, and then I ended up, and I ended up pulling it out of the book before I submitted it to the contest because it wasn't doing the work I thought it needed to do. This is the Alice James contest. Alice James contest, yeah. yeah. And then in the process of going back to it, I saw what the poem was missing after I had some distance and wrote a new sestina. And working on that one taught me, and this is the thing, is I'm always trying to teach myself through the work. And working on that one taught me what was wrong with the first, and then so I kind of reworked that one. Mm -hmm. And then I had the structure for a book that could go a lot of places, but still feel unified yeah. by having a Sestina as the second poem, a Sestina as the penultimate poem, and then those six fears spread through the book. Mm -hmm. And um, and that became like kind of my anchors. And they, I, I thought of them as like almost like little planets that other poems kind of like can so, oh, nice. orbit, you know? Yeah. So um, so you get this feeling where the so what connects the poems isn't as clear as, mm -hmm. as expected as um, I mean. The first approach to it was what's yeah. called a prescriptive ordering. And yeah. that would be, you know, if it, the book was ordered that way, it would be, here's all the phobia poems, here are all the love poems, here are all the poems about family. Yeah. And a lot of books work, function really well that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, but, but in a book where I was trying to say, like, all of this mismatched stuff kind of does go together, yeah. I wanted it to be kind of more seamless, how it flowed. So I started looking for other textures to make things work. Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, thalassophobia is the fear of the sea. Yeah. So poems that have a lot of water texture and, and, like, and metaphors about drowning and things like that kind of hover near that poem. Mm -hmm. And um, the fear of needles kind of hovers near a uh, love poem. And you get mm -hmm. kind of discord and match at the same time because sure. you get a poem about drug addiction followed by a love poem, which I wouldn't mm -hmm. have thought to do if I was ordering it by theme. But when you put them together by texture, by the needle point, yeah. all of a sudden, the poem about obsession and um, decay also resonates about love. Sure, and sure. there's a love for the person the poem addresses. Um, and so that's how I use the phobias to kind of give me these like grounding points. And it mm. just kind of matches what I try to do in poems. Like I yeah. set the posts and then I get wild in between them. <laughs> and they do get wild. Your poems travel wonderfully. Thank um, you. They do. Um, you are a, f a founder of Organic Weapon Arts, yeah. the, the press. I'm wondering, as, as a reader for that press and as a publisher of other people's work, yeah. what you're looking for and how that has influenced your own work. Oh, yeah. So um, we like um, one of the big things Vivi taught me was to read broadly. Uh -huh. uh, she said a lot of people were afraid to read their peers because they think they, they were saying, yeah. they'll say things like, I don't want to be influenced. But the, what the actually a way to voice sound like other people is to read everyone and yeah. pick up the skills because your voice will rise to the top of that. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of try to look for like, um, try to read really broadly mm -hmm. um, when we're reading um, submissions. We've been fortunate enough to get like a good range of people submitting mm -hmm. and I think because we're so open to different communities and connect to all kinds of people, mm -hmm. um, and, which I'm running with my partner Tarfia Faizula right now and she kind of has similar philosophy with yeah. this. And so what I'm looking for is usually like um, the, the idiosyncratic voice, you know, mm -hmm. like um, that feeling that there is a mind behind the poems, not like a disembodied mm -hmm. voice floating above existence. You know, yeah. I kind of want to feel like there's a, like there's there's some some tension and something was given up for the in, poems to exist. In reading all the submissions that you get for your press, has that opened you up to new things in your own work or kind of tendencies that you yeah. may have? I know reading yeah, for definitely. Alice James. Yeah. 
I've, I've read manuscripts yeah. and being Actually, like, oh, I do that. Oh, yeah, it feels oh, like no. cheating. Like, um, <laughs> reading for our arts and then also having read for journals like King and yeah. Review and West Branch, it yeah. also feels like I'm cheating because I get to get a little glimpse at what everybody's yeah. doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and people are doing some cool stuff. And, like, we've published poets that are like, pretty far away from my aesthetic, like yeah. um, Jane Wong. She has these really compressed, um, um, almost avant-garde poems, yeah. you know, in, in that particular chat yeah. book, and um, and it was, and that, and then, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm looking at my second book. I've got a couple of these really compressed. They're not, yeah. uh, they're not they don't leap as far as Jane's poems do. But, but they were that influenced by. Just had Unfortunately, to be we're by running out of time. So the name of the new book, upcoming book, is the Big Book of Exit Strategies, which is going to be published by Alice James, James Books, Books next yes. year. It has been so nice talking to Jamal. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me again. And thank you so much. You've been watching the. Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. If you'd like to know more about the creative writing program at Brookdale, please check us out at www.brookdalecc.edu. Thanks.